So last night I asked a question about the Northern Michigan Geological Repository and learned that Rio Tinto's contribution to that effort by which high-level state officials and mining company officials have formed a nonprofit yes. to store uh, mine cores. And the funds that Rio Tinto contributed to that, you didn't know last night, I don't know if you know now, but they're not included in that. Pile. Correct. Okay. So I've been following this, and an organization submitted a FOIA request under state law to that nonprofit. Are you familiar with that request? No, no. And so it wasn't responded to. And then a couple of weeks ago, they filed a lawsuit challenging the failure to respond to that Freedom of Information request. And so <clears throat> that got me thinking back to constitutional law and the 14th Amendment and the equal access provision under the 14th Amendment, which is squarely uh, focused on states. It's my understanding that the requirement to maintain this core shed, this repository, is a state requirement. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. state law. And Rio Tinto and ostensibly the other mining companies like Bitterroot were just trying to help the state do what it's required to do by law here. Mm -hmm. In essence. Okay. Yep. This is unusual and unprecedented. But I'd like to go to the, um, the uh, picture that you had and your explanation of how the twist operates. So you pointed out in the bottom left uh, yep. corner there, that is where the twist is located. Correct. And you said that the twist discharges these uh, treated industrial mine water discharge fluids underground. No, the pipes actually lay on the surface. Lay on the surface of the ground. Yes. And then it seeps into the ground. Correct. And so is it your understanding that it seeps into the ground and that it will come in contact with groundwater first, or will it come in contact with surface waters first? Mm. Groundwater. So Kristen is our environmental uh, manager, and she's here tonight to answer more te technical questions. Um, and groundwater? Yes. First. Groundwater first, and then surface water. Is that correct? Eventually, eventually, what happens is it takes about three to five years for the groundwater in that location to travel to an area where the groundwater is seeping out of the ground, and it forms the headwaters of the East Branch of the Salmon Trout River. So, how would you know whether or not it's groundwater seeping out of the ground, or whether or not it's discharges from the twists that are seeping out of the ground and flowing into surface waters or the east branch of the salmon trout river. How would you be able to delineate that? So when the permit, when they filed for a permit, or when they filed for a permit, they went for a groundwater discharge permit. This is prior to me being there. Um, they went for a groundwater discharge permit and one of the things that was identified was these seeps that are approximately a mile away. So if you look at the permeabilities and everything, it takes about three to five years for the water to travel that distance in that ground. So what happened was the groundwater discharge permit applies the designated use for the salmon trout, the east branch of the salmon trout, the designated use would have certain surface water criteria associated with it. And those were applied to our permit as well as groundwater discharge requirements. So we monitor our we monitor our water both with compliance points in the wells to, um, to abide by the groundwater regulations, but we also monitor our effluent to ensure that we meet surface water criteria at that venting location. So that's why we have a mercury limit that is 2.1 nanograms per liter, because we showed through modeling that traveling that distance through the ground, we would meet the 1.3 nanogram per liter requirement by the Great Lakes Initiative. So, so both criteria are applied in our groundwater discharge permit. Just a couple of clarifying questions. So at the point in time that it was decided that the discharges from the twist would come in contact with groundwater that would eventually, five miles through modeling, I would, would assume you uh, 
project would then come in contact with surface water and flow into the east branch of the south right. uh, of, of, of the uh, right. Sandwich Harbor River. That was before the twist was redesigned. Because the twist, and this is this is where I'm coming from, because okay, no. Matt, Matt said that with Brown he made a mistake there, goes into the ground. Because in March, March 24th, 2010, Rio Tinto wrote EPA a letter. You remember EPA was mandating an underground injection control permit under the Safe Drinking Water Act provisions, and Rio Tinto redesigned the twist mm -hmm. right before they wrote that letter and said that uh, do not, does not discharge fluids below the surface of the ground. So if you don't discharge fluids below the surface of the ground in the first place, how does it get to groundwater before it gets to surface water? Because we're discharging, it's just like if you took a pitcher of water and poured it on the ground, it's going to sink into the ground. It will, it will reach the groundwater well before it will reach the surface water. It will reach the groundwater and travel with that groundwater gradient to the surface water. But let me add one thing, that redesign doesn't really change anything because we were never relying on the ground for treatment. That water is clean before it ever goes into the ground. So it doesn't matter if it's applied on the surface or applied three feet below the surface. That water is just, it's the same water either way. Would you agree that it matters with respect to a regulatory decision as to whether or not a groundwater permit, an underground injection control permit, or a national pollution elimination discharge systems permit is appropriate? I think that we have the appropriate permit. We have a groundwater discharge permit because we're putting the, ground, the water back in the ground. We're not injecting it underground. So I do think that the regulations were applied appropriately. And just to finish off on the on your geological repository, repository question, uh, Jeffrey was at the Marquette Forum, which we held last night, and asked a question about uh, an organization called NIMGRA, the Northern Michigan Geological Repository Association. And Rio Tinto is a member of that association, and where that association has purchased a um, old building at the KSOA Air Force Base, and that we use for storage of some of our core. We make a donation to that association to pay for that building's rent uh, where we are storing for it. It's not included in our community contributions because we're benefiting from that. We pay for our rent on basically a building that we're using. So the state doesn't have any ownership of the building or, and are not members of the organization. It is our hope, NIMGRA's hope, that in time they will um, dismantle the organization and the association. At such time the building is paid off, we can donate that to the state. That becomes the new. Uh, state of Michigan repository, which is required by the state by state law to have. So, do you understand the state is uh, neither the state nor any official of the state of Michigan is part of the nonprofit? I don't believe that they are part of the nonprofit. But you know, these are questions. Instead of FOIAing, you can always just call me and ask. No, I'm not, I didn't submit any FOIAs, yeah. but I can but say just this for future reference. I, I, I can this, say I can say this, this, this that that it's a very unusual circumstance where a nonprofit is formed. And the building that you talked to, which is leased for $400,000, and not-for-profits are required to report. They've been reporting that they've received less than $25,000 a year, every year for four years, but their lease costs $400,000 over five years. So I don't know how they're paying that lease. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to get back to that one, just for the sake of time, we'll get to some other people.